Hi, I'm Ross. I'm Matt. And we're the Duffin Brothers, and we created Stranger Things. And this is a definitive list of all the film references in Stranger Things. Well, most of them. Ish. <laughs> away from her, you bitch! So we're huge fans of the Alien franchise, especially um, Alien Aliens. It depends on, on the year in terms of which one we think is, is better. Basically, they're both incredible films. Aliens in particular really had a big influence on season two, especially when we have the soldiers going to the underground tunnel system. But all this stuff in terms of atmospheric effects, some of it we, we were inspired by video game Silent Hill, but some of it was also inspired by what it was like when they went on the planet in, uh, in Ridley Scott's Alien. And then we even have an, an egg there, the Demogorgon egg, which is inspired by the uh, what they discover on the planet in Alien. And that egg was real. And no, one. and in season one, especially all the spores, all the, um, the spores blowing through the air, that was all real. We were blowing them around. Um, we had David and Winona walking around in those suits in the forest. It was old school, just blowing uh, these basically little tiny feathers um, in their faces. It was a lot of fun for them. <laughs> oh God, please tell me it's not the kid. Police officer who discovers Will's body, we gave a little nod to Dan O'Bannon, who was the uh, writer for Alien. We should be safe because we think this is just an isolated incident. State Trooper David O'Bannon, thank you so much for your help. Thank you, sir. As we've said uh, before, Alien was such a huge reference for us. Altered States, I think, mostly was an inspiration in terms of just the experiments that Brenner was performing on Eleven, specifically the isolation tank is something we discussed about and, uh, and looked at that film when we, were, when we were building our isolation tank. But it's a trippy, trippy film yeah. that could have only been made in the 70s. I think it was 1980, now that I think about it. Come close. You know, when we first came up with this idea, we were, we were always talking about Stephen King and, and why his books resonated so much with us. And one of those books, of course, was, was Carrie. And Carrie, of course, you have a high school girl who has these amazing powers and these amazing abilities. And we, we always looked at how King dealt with that when we, we talked about Eleven and this idea. She has these amazing abilities, but is she ultimately dangerous, especially when, we would see, when she's with these kids and we see her when she hurts Lucas out in the junkyard. And we sort of, sort of see that these powers aren't necessarily fully under her control or that she can lose control. And, and when she does, she can be dangerous. Looking at that as, as a girl with these powers who's unable to fit into society, you know, is a real big touchstone for us. The two Stevens are the biggest influence for us, so we've talked a little bit about Stephen King, and then there's Steven Spielberg, who you may have heard of. There was a lot of imagery in season two that evoked Close Encounters of the Third Kind, particularly the sequence where Barry is kidnapped. That was the sequence when we were kids and we saw Close Encounters for the first time that kind of stayed with us the most. So when Will is first getting signals from the Upside Down in episode one and he hears thunder outside and he opens that door, that's a pretty direct homage to Close Encounters. And we do an homage with this year with Dustin when his toys sort of all go out of control and he has to, I mean, he realizes ultimately that it's just uh, Eleven manipulating it, but that was definitely a nod towards it. And then, and that, that was all. All those toys were so we had every toy was on a on a remote control, and it was one of those things where you know there are about ten toys, there's ten remotes, and you figure it's going to be an absolute disaster, and it actually worked out. Just in every well. every hiding spot behind sofas, beds, closets, there was someone with a remote control, and they were all trying to get these things to all work together. It was actually. When it worked, it was it was really miraculous. And the last thing about Close Encounters, I will say, is also, you know, it's set in Indiana, and that was a big uh, touchstone for us when we were deciding where to set the show. So it was things like Close Encounters and Breaking Away that uh, really inspired us uh, as kids growing up. So we felt that was a great everywhere USA uh, kind of location. <laughs> Cujo, we obviously referenced that in season one. I think we have we have one of the guards in Hawkins' lab reading Cujo. It had a really nice big picture of Stephen King on the back, <laughs> and we thought that was a way of tipping our hat hey. to the king, of course. I love that book. It's a nasty mutt. 
If it wasn't um, obvious enough that we owed him a debt, we try to make it more obvious in that in that shot. <laughs> that's right. And then in season two, we have some the, the demo dogs. There's kind of a new creature, so big, big bat dogs. So they're a little bit Cujo. They're a little bit dogs from Ghostbusters. <laughs> but um, big, bad, scary dogs are always fun. E.T. Home phone. E.T. was a big film for us growing up, as it was for a lot of kids. It was, like, mildly traumatizing. But, you know, it was a huge influence on us in terms of the opening scene of Stranger Things is, you know, our kids playing Dungeons and & Dragons and eating pizza. And that's, there. you know, there's obviously a scene in E.T. where the kids are playing D&D. &D but the idea of basically a kid in a relatable suburban setting who encounters something extraordinary, the feeling that that gave us as kids is the feeling that we wanted to capture with the show. And then in episode so three in season one, we have the kids also trying to dress up Eleven to make her seem like a normal girl, which was, was a nod to when they they try to they dress up E.T. to try to make E.T. fit in. And then in season two, of course, is our Halloween season, and, and E.T. is set around Halloween. So uh, we looked at that for inspiration in terms of the costumes that all the kids were wearing as they sort of went out and went out into the world. When we pitched this to Netflix, we, we cut together a little reel that, you know, included some of the movies we love just to get across tone, and it also it was scored to John Carpenter music. So that's sort of always been our go-to and sort of what the sound, the show can sound like. In season two, in episode seven, when Eleven ends up going to Chicago and meeting up with her sister, we use one of his scores from Escape from New York. <laughs> We attempt with it, and we just we said this is, this has got to go in the show because it, it it just fits too perfectly. Firestarter a, a, was a big reference specifically for Eleven in the case that you've got a young girl that has these incredible powers. She's on the run from the government, and we also looked at Firestarter in terms of sort of the backstory for Eleven and how she can how how she could possibly get these powers. So we needed something visual that would represent what Eleven using her powers. You know, when she when she uses her abilities, she gets a nosebleed, and that was something we settled on very early on that we thought would very simply tell the audience each time she's used these powers. Will you play with me? Frankenstein uh, w was a reference in, w and we included it in uh, episode two of season two when Eleven's at home alone and she's watching. And the reason we want to include that and the reason we've talked about Frankenstein writing this is that this is just that Eleven is feeling like the Frankenstein's monster and that she's feeling isolated and alone and she, she feels different from everyone else and just cut off and she feels like a monster. And so that's why we wanted her to be uh, watching that film in uh, episode, I mean, episode two. Aim for the flat top! Ghostbusters is one of our favorite films of yes. all time. I, 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 I mean, I, we watched it way too many times as children, so it's, it's all over the show. It's one of the one, you know, we gave a pretty, the, probably the most direct reference to Ghostbusters in season two when we obviously have the kids dress up as Ghostbusters. Cause we were trying to figure out what they're gonna wear for Halloween. One of them was gonna always be a Ghostbusters and then someone was like, why aren't they all just Ghostbusters? They can each be a Ghostbusters. And that, and, and so that was so fun, dressing up all of our kids and also um, deciding as these who, characters. And deciding who would be who when we, you know, just arguing about it in the room and being like everyone would wanna be Venkman. And so that sort of led to the, the Venkman uh, argument. Why are you Venkman? Because I'm Venkman. No, I'm Venkman. Why can't there just be two Venkmans? Because there's only one Venkman in real life. We planned this months ago. You're kidding. Gremlins is, uh, first of all, one of our favorite films growing up, and it was also a big reference, particularly in season two of the show, with Dart, which, like Gizmo, begins as this sort of loving creature that Dustin is trying to take care of, and he, and he, and he starts to actually care for this cute little thing. And then, of course, we realize that it's anything but it's, it's a baby Demogorgon. And I think there's a scene in uh, episode three, I believe, where Dart is starting to grow when he escapes, and the kids are trying to attack it and, and go after it. And we, we had our composer sort of do a little theme that sounded like uh, a little bit like the original uh, Gremlins theme, because we just wanted to give it a little, a little tip of the hat.
we're big Indiana Jones fans. We are big fans of Temple of Doom, and specifically we referenced it. I think it was in um, season two, episode nine, the the final episode of season two, when we have Max driving Billy's car, and she's got a block on the uh, pedal, just like Short Round has to use a block in order to drive the car in Temple of Doom when they make their escape. I remember our production designer being like, Sadie doesn't need a block, she can reach that, and then we, and we were so devastated because we wanted to give that little nod, but then we put Sadie in the car and she could not reach the pedal. <laughs> I'm sure now she could, but luckily in season two she couldn't, so we got our, we got our block in there. Obviously, Indiana Jones himself, you know, is a big reference for Hopper. We always, we talk to David about Harrison Ford probably more than anything else. I'm trying to just sort of capture that energy. That's one reason we have Hopper punching people all the time, because Indiana Jones punches people all the time. David was upset because in season two, he didn't get to punch anybody. And so in season three, there's a ton of um, Hopper punching people. David is really good at capturing the, the Harrison Ford essence. Not many modern actors are able to do it, <laughs> uh, aside from Harrison Ford, of course, <laughs> who is the one and only Indiana Jones. There can be no more. That's right. The opening scene of season three includes something horrible happening to some scientists that we were inspired by the ending of Raiders of the Lost Ark, where they open the Ark and it just causes these horrific things to happen and that just seared itself into our brain. So we wanted to give a... A little nod, a little nod to that. Like sometimes I'm more in the mood to watch um, Last Crusade. The the banter between Sean Connery. Ha- Sean Connery and Harrison Ford, and it's just it's it's very similar to Raiders, of course, but it's just got a little bit of a, it's got a little bit of a different tone. And but if you just want to really learn how it. to make a film, I mean, just watch Raiders. I mean, every scene is a masterclass. It really is. Nightmare on Elm Street was a huge film for us growing up. It really scared us, but we couldn't help but keep watching it. Episode three in season one, when uh, Holly goes up to the wall and you can see the Demogorgon moving from behind the wall, which is very similar to when you see Freddy Krueger coming out of the wall above Nancy's bed in Nightmare on Elm Street. But it's funny, because in Nightmare on Elm Street, they tried, they did that practically, that effect of Kruger coming through the wall with latex, and that's what we attempted to do and, and failed. We basically had our, dim, our, our monster, a guy in a suit, um, pressing him, his face and hands through the wall. And it wasn't particularly scary. We had a little, the little toddler on set um, playing Holly, and she thought it was amusing, which was <laughs> a sign that it wasn't exactly working. So we had to uh, enhance it quite a bit with uh, CG and post-production. So it, it, we were, especially in season one, determined to do everything practically, and I think maybe it was like a 50% success rate. But it makes you more impressed about, yeah, in terms of, or more blown away by what they were able to achieve back then. Aren't you going to say hello? Well, Stephen King's it huge influence on the show. We actually first experienced it when we saw the miniseries back in uh, 1990, so we were around six or seven, way too young for this thing. Um, we already were deathly scared of clowns, and that just pushed it over the edge. Couldn't yeah. sleep for a couple weeks. Like, it, the most scared I've ever been in my life. It's an incredible book. It's really about these kids and, and their friendship and how by you know working together and uniting and through their the, the strength of their friendship they're able to overcome this incredible interdimensional evil so without it i'm you know there you know there really would be no stranger things probably sure. you're gonna need a bigger boat when we have to name a favorite film we usually lean on jaws because i think it does to us everything that we love love about cinema it has great characters comedy, yeah, spectacle. It's about a chief of, chief of police small and, town. in a small town where something out of the ordinary happens. So it's a big influence in big that influence. way. I mean, we have Hopper's car is, is very much, uh, very closely inspired by Chief Brody's car. And also in season three, you know, we've been wanting a Larry, Larry Vaughn is the mayor in Jaws, and we've been wanting a Larry Vaughn character every year, and we've never just had room, and we finally had room this year for it. So Carrie Elvis, who's just incredible, has come in and sort of taken on this part of mayor that's very much inspired by that, where it's someone who is much more concerned about his doing well for himself than he is necessarily about the well-being of the town. Whenever we were talking about the Demogorgon in season one, he was very much influenced by the shark and jaws because um, we wanted it to be a shark-like creature, except instead of coming out from under the water, he was coming out from another dimension. So that was, he would break through the surface of that dimension, reach into ours, grab a victim, 
like Barb, for instance, and pull that victim back into his world. So instead of the underwater, it's um, the upside down. John Hughes, you know, was a big influence in, in all of his films were really, you know, it's just something that's about these sort of outcasts that are coming together and, and, you know, they have all these differences, but at the end of the day, they end up realizing that they have more in common than they thought. And that sort of character development is something we talk about uh, when we're working on the show. When we were working on season two or developing season two, we always knew we wanted to end at the snowball, which is an idea that we had introduced at the end of, even end of season one. And so we always knew that that was gonna be the ending of season two. It feels like at least 50% or more of the classic teen 80s films feature some sort of massive dance where everything goes down. John Hughes is especially a master of that. And so we wanted to pay pay homage to, to that. This year we have a new character who he's working with at, at the mall, which is Robin, played by Maya Hawk. And so the, the whole vibe there in the mall is very John Hughes in that we have a bunch of characters kind of forced to work together who normally would not associate with one another. We saw Jurassic Park in theaters and I just remember it, it just blew our minds just in terms of the spectacle and the, the dinosaurs were just so incredible and they, and they, and they honestly still are. It, it holds up so well and Jurassic Park is referenced or was a reference for us in season two, particularly episode eight, when our characters are stuck in Hawkins' lab and they have to escape and Bob has to go and uh, sort of, re you know, he has to go and reset the power in order for them to get out, which is very similar to when Lord Durham has to sort of follow a map with the power going back on in Jurassic Park. It goes better for Laura Dern, though, it than it did for Bob, unfortunately for Bob. And then also season season three, it's a pretty big reference. We have a lot, we have some hiding sequences uh, with the children uh, this year that is, was very much inspired by the uh, classic uh, kitchen scene in Jurassic Park, where they're hiding from those raptors. It's still, is, we, we watch that over and over again. I mean, I, I think it's one of, it's, you know, one of the best suspense sequences in film history, which is uh, when the kids are hiding from the raptors in the kitchen. Incredible filmmaking. You can learn everything you need to know about directing suspense from watching that scene. We're big Mad Max fans, so when this new kid, Max, comes into town, we figured she'd likely be a Mad Max fan as well. And like Max, she's an outsider that's sort of coming into this community. So we felt that it, it, it applied to her character and that this is someone that feels very different than the others and she's, she's really an outcast. And then ultimately she ends up, of course, bonding with a group and becoming a hero. And then driving like a badass, driving, driving like Mel Gibson. Hello! Whoa. Incredible. Told you, Zoomer. Just take those old records off the shelf. Risky Business. First of all, if you haven't seen Risky Business, you know it's a great film. It's kind of weirdly dark '80s film. In season two, it's one of our more direct references, of course. Again, Steve and Nancy arrive at their Halloween party dressed as the characters from Whiskey Business. Which, Which also worked because it was all white when we wanted it to, when she spills the punch, to be a, to be a very dramatic event. So the, that all white outfit really worked out for us. What the hell? Oh my God. Scanners is a great film and it's, it was a reference for us, particularly in terms of Eleven Powers. So in episode seven of, of season one, where she just sort of makes the uh, government agents' minds melt. It's not as grotesque as Scanners. I don't think Netflix would have loved it if we had blown their heads up, but uh, th that was our version of it. Without getting into too big spoiler territory, we definitely go a bit Cronenberg in season three of the show. And when we were temping sound, I remember, we couldn't quite get the right exploding sound, so <laughs> for the temp sound, we, uh, we, we just took it from Scanners. <laughs> uh, it was the best explosion sound we could find still. <laughs> Stand By Me is one of our favorite films. We saw it when we were really young. I remember being a big deal because we were watching an R-rated movie, which we weren't allowed to watch a lot of R-rated movies. Because they just cursed, because they just cursed though, it was, a, uh, our parents deemed it was okay. Deemed it appropriate, and yeah. I thought we should watch it, and I'm really glad they let us watch it. Um, you know, Stand By Me is based on a novella by Stephen King called The Body. It's not a coincidence that we named uh, episode four of season one, The Body. Sort of our most direct nod to it is when we have 
Well, in season one and two, we have characters sort of walking down these these train tracks, um, which is you know that was a, that was a big part of, of Stand by Me as they were following the train tracks to the body. So that's probably our most our most direct homage to that to that classic. We actually, when we were auditioning our kids, we had them audition with scenes um, from that film. I think a lot of our kids hadn't seen Stand by Me, and we that was a homework assignment for them that they had to watch Stand by Me. Empire Strikes Back is, uh, I mean, we go back and forth whether we like that or New Hope better. It's sort of like Alien Aliens. It depends on uh, uh, day of the week. But it was a big film for us growing up. And first of all, Eleven Powers uh, can be seen as Force-like, and that's why we have Mike showing her the, the Yoda figurine uh, in his room in, in episode two, Weirdo on, on Maple Street. And, uh, the boys are obviously huge uh, Star Wars fans, as they would be at that time. And so and when Dustin feels he's being, someone's being a traitor, he refers to them as Lando, which is obviously a reference to, to Empire as well. Lando Calrissian, would you shut up about Lando? And then also we always saw Episode seven of season two is sort of Eleven going to her Dagobah and seeing her Yoda, uh, which was eight, you know, and sort of in this experience, gaining some sort of uh, in enhancement of her powers that allows her to defeat this evil. So, you know, her especially moving the train, you know, it's, it's, it's very much uh, evokes uh, Luke trying to pull his plane out of the swamp. Out of the yeah. swamp or... Super 8, so a lot like our show, it was paying homage and it and trying to capture the spirit of these films that we, we grew up loving. We have a, a scene in season two, episode six, I believe, when they're in the, uh, the kids are hiding in the, in the bus and the, the demo dogs are attacking it, which is similar to a scene uh, in Super 8 when they're, when they're also hiding the bus from the giant monsters um, coming from them. And, and one of the boys in Super 8 uses firecrackers to fight the, fight the monster without that's true. Giving away too much, the kids may or may not employ fireworks to their advantage in season three. The Evil Dead is one of those movies that we saw when we were way too young. You know, it's a pretty funny movie, actually. Um, but, you know, when you're that young, the humor is completely lost in you, and we just thought it was straight-up terrifying. I'm trying to think, like, specifically what we referenced. Well, about. it's the poster. Obviously, oh, yeah, well, Jonathan has the poster up in his room, which uh, his uh, deadbeat dad uh, disapproves of. But we felt like Jonathan would be someone who would like this. Because, you know, it was an independent film at the time. It was it was still it was pretty, uh, pretty extreme uh, back then, as it is still now. And so we felt, though, that Jonathan as this outcast would be someone who would love, uh, love Evil Dead. I'm not sure how he saw it, actually, but, you know, <laughs> he found a way. <laughs> he did. Amen. Well, The Exorcist, obviously, if you're going to have any sort of evil child, that is the, the go-to go to film. And so in season two, when we have Will Possess, you know, cer certainly, you know, his head doesn't spin around, but... We did try to capture a little bit of that eeriness that you'd feel from uh, Linda Blair. And Will, of course, he you know he likes it cold. The Mind Flayer likes it cold. Reagan and in The Exorcist. I mean, it's it it gets over the course of that film. It gets the the temperature in that house That's gets right. in, gets increasingly cold. Fog was a big reference for us in terms of specifically in terms of the music score. We cut together a trailer for Netflix to help sh sell the show. We used a, right. um, a track from The Fog. This year, there's a very fog-like scene in season three. This isn't getting too spoilery, I hope, but you see Billy in the upside down and he sees some figures coming towards him out of the fog. Who those figures are, you have to watch. The Goonies, the Goonies. Uh, the Goonies. <laughs> I remember, when, I mean, when we first watched The Goonies when we were kids, we immediately just hit rewind on the VHS and watched it again. And uh, obviously, just sort of the energy that the kids had and the camaraderie was a, was a, is a big touchstone for us. Yeah, and, and specifically, I think it was probably more overtly referenced in season two yeah. when we had, you know, in, in, in the final episode, um, season nine, when, when they go all go down into the tunnel together. It feels a lot like the Goonies going underground in search of their treasure. It's a little bit of a darker 
uh, take on that, but it was a big reference. And of course, we had, you know, one the, the lead of uh, the Goonies was Sean Astin, who, you know, we cast in season two as Bob, which was, you know, a real treat for us. So to have a grown up Sean Astin in our film, and he, in fact, references something as a, uh, as a, as a treasure map. Don't you get it? It's not a puzzle, it's a map. It's a map of Hawkins. So a little, little nod to his, his role in the Goonies and Sean was all about doing it. I'll be back. We're big fans. I'm sure this is a surprise. The Terminator franchise. In the vast minority in that, that I prefer the original Terminator to T2. I'm going to get some hate for that. Arnold's a bad dude. So. Arnold, I like Arnold as a bad guy. Yeah. And so very much we wanted to have our own Arnold this year in season three, and we found the most incredible Arnold look-alike, but he also captures very much the spirit of Arnold, and I wish I could talk about the character more without spoiling things, but I can't, that just, we have a Terminator-esque character who is not a robot, however. There's not like some twist that he's a robot. That would be a little ridiculous. Yeah. So The Thing is one of our favorite movies. I think we saw it a little bit later. Like I think we were in high school because there's like all the movie books that talked about how this wasn't a good movie, which just blows my mind. <laughs> you know, speci especially season three, just in terms of that we have, again, I don't want to get too spoily, but the monster or monsters uh, uh, this season are sort of inspired by the monster work that they did on The Thing in terms of that. It's certainly our grossest season yet, and, and that's one thing we, we do love about the thing, which is just sort of how uh, uh, grotesque it is. And there's actually a dialogue scene between the kids in season three where they discuss the merits of what is better, the, the Howard Hawks, the thing, the original thing from the 50s, or uh, John Carpenter's uh, remake. It's like Carpenter's The Thing. The original is the classic, no question about it. But the remake? We also, of course, season two, we have the flamethrower element and the fact that this thing doesn't doesn't react well to flame, that the creatures react ne negatively to fire. I mean, that, that was a big element and um, in the thing, and there's nothing cooler really than Kurt Russell with a flamethrower. To show our love and affection for the thing, we have the boys in the basement. Mike has a poster of the thing. And Mr. Clark is when they call him to oh, try yeah. to figure out about the, uh, how to create their own sort of isolation tank. Mr. Clark, of course, is watching the thing uh, with his girlfriend and, and trying to explain how they created these effects in the first place. Because again, Matt and I are just still, you know, we love to research that stuff because it really is mind blowing what they achieved. I want you to tell me everything you saw when you went in the bathroom. Witness. So it's weird. So so not everything we reference is, um, you know, is a genre film. And so we're huge fans of the, the director, um, Peter Weir. But there, there was a scene, um, with Harrison Ford in the police station when um, a little the little boy in the police station points at a picture of of the murderer who ha murderer who happens to be actually a cop who works with Harrison Ford's character. We had a sort of very similar scene by coincidence where Eleven sees the photo of Will while in Mike's room and points at it, and we really weren't quite sure how to shoot the scene, and we really looked at Witness and how Peter Weir shot that scene and. And he, he used a lot of, you know, of, of zooming camera. And at that point, before then, we hadn't really used the zoom okay. because we were worried about it being too cheesy or cliche. But a after we shot that scene, we loved how it turned out. And we now kind of embrace the zoom. Thanks, Wired. So that has been each and every movie reference in Stranger Mostly. Things. Mostly. Not, not all, but, but a lot. No, most of them. A lot of them. 70%, <laughs> 80%. Yeah.